Good morning, Living Church. Why don't you stand and worship with us this morning? For the things you've done And I come to you Every night and day But to give you praise You're amazing Forever reigning My God There's no one like you None beside you My God Oh Everywhere I go I will lift your name in all I do, I will give you praise. Everywhere I go, I will lift your name up. I lift your name up. Bye. 
voice and shout every wall comes crashing down i have the authority that jesus has given Come on, me church, do you believe that this morning? when i open up my mouth miracles start This is the part of service where we take just a few minutes to celebrate our champion of heaven and what he's done for us. And so on your way in, you should have gotten one of these little cups. If you haven't, if you would just give the ushers a wave as they're coming up and down the aisles, they'll make sure that you have one because we want to take just a few moments to celebrate communion. You know, when I was a kid's pastor for Living Church, I had a kid ask me one time, hey, Pastor Tim, how come they serve snacks sometimes in big church, but they don't other times? And I said something to this effect, because why would Jesus ask us to celebrate communion even hundreds of years after the event? Why would he ask us to go back and revisit the cross? And the reason is because he knew that there would be those of us that would walk in and as time faded from our uh, initial moment of salvation that we would forget we would forget what it is exactly that Jesus saved us from where we were in sin and where we were in misery and and we'd forget because as time got better we just it'd be harder to remember and he knew that there'd be another group in here that doesn't have any trouble remembering what they did yesterday because it plays in their dreams every night and wakes them up every morning remembering the things they did before they met Jesus. And for both of those groups, Jesus would have a celebrate communion to say that you can't continue to punish yourself for what I already paid for, that I've already taken care of it. And so I want you to take just a few moments every now and then to remember that I laid my life down as a bridge across a chasm called sin that you could never cross on your own because I wanted to be with you in heaven forever one day. And so you can go ahead and take off that first wrapper on that as we celebrate. We find in the Bible in 1 Corinthians that it says the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You can go ahead and eat that cracker. And when you're done with that, you can go ahead and remove that second wrapper for the cup. It said in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back. You see, sometimes we need to remember that even when we don't see it, he's working. Even when we don't feel it, he's working. And so you can go ahead and drink from that cup and remember today. Father, we thank you that in a moment when we couldn't have helped ourselves, that you bankrupted heaven, sent the prince of heaven down to live a perfect life and to pay a price that he didn't deserve to pay because you cared more about reconciling with us than you did about anything else. Jesus, we thank you that no matter where we were, that you were willing to start a journey with us. Where No matter where we are, you're willing to start a journey with us today. We thank you for the price that you paid in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Living Church. Let's continue to worship and remember today. Come on, sing this out with me. Moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you're working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. Come on, every hand lifted across this room. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. Yeah. I worship you. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yeah, cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, you are here, you're touching every September and uh, 
I thought it was over because I have an irregular heartbeat and I have asthma and I thought it was just done for. I was like, I'm out, can't even finish college, I'm done. <laughs> but how many of you know that we serve a God of breakthrough and we serve a God that is just, he's the miracle worker and he's the promise keeper. I was sent to the hospital because I stopped breathing a couple times and I couldn't breathe at all and it was just bad. And, and the doctors said they couldn't help because they were all busy. But as I begin to sit in the, in the waiting room in the wheelchair, I begin to lift my hands up and plead the blood of Jesus. I begin to plead the blood of Jesus because I know it still works and I've seen it works. The blood of Jesus breaks every chain. The blood of Jesus breaks every bondage. The blood of Jesus is breakthrough. The blood of Jesus is joy. The blood of Jesus is peace. And that is who he is today. So I want you guys to sing this new bridge with me. Yeah. Whatever your plan is. You'll make a way for whatever your will is, come and do it here. Whatever your plan is, you'll make a way for whatever your will is, come and do it here. Whatever your plan is, you'll make a way for. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, yeah, cause you are way make miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, yeah, whatever your plan is, you'll make a way. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. We're Come on, with every hand lifted across this room, let's press in. Worthy is your name, Jesus. I don't know what you're dealing with, but press in this morning. Press in just to sit in his presence. Just to sit in his presence. Worthy is, worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve, and worthy is, worthy is your name.
Living Church. So excited to be in the house of God this morning. They sound a little asleep. I'm not going to lie to you. They sound a little asleep. Are y'all excited to be in the house of God this morning? Come there we go. On, That's better. Somebody. That's better. Hey, so excited you guys are here this morning. It's already been a fantastic sir. Worship. Don't even get me started. Don't even get me started. Can y'all give it started. up for that worship team one more time? Hey, if this is your first time here at Living Church, man, we just want to say welcome to the family. Thank yeah. you so much for being here. And can we give it up for all of our first time guests? Come on. Clap one more time. Come on. All the clapping. All right. We, if you are a first time guest here with Living Church today, do us a favor and scan this QR code up on the screen so that we can meet you and get to know you a little bit better this morning. It's, it's easy. It's so easy. It's so easy from the front of the room to the back of the room. Just open up your camera and you can scan that QR code. If you right have there. an iPhone, it's easy. If you have an iPhone, it's easy. If you have an Android, we're praying for you. Apple we're praying service. for you. God's going to do a miracle in your life. We believe it this morning. Uh, so excited that you guys are here. You know, if anyone's been here for a certain amount of time, Bailey, what's like a next step? Oh, are you asking me if there's more? Of course I am. I mean, what more. else would I be asking? If you guys are ready to take some more steps in your walk with Jesus, we want you to take the step to serve and be a party starter here at Living Church. What does party starter look like? Like, where are some places you can start some parties? You can serve all over the place, all the way from our 6 a.m. crew that sets up and tears down every week Sheesh. to our next-gen teams, our living kids, oh, come and on, our we need it. living youth department. Oh, you already know on Wednesday nights, it'd That's be popping. It'd be popping. It's crazy. Or you can join our creative teams all over the place, our incredible yeah. men and women serving the house of God. We think we just pushing buttons, getting all this stuff up. It's no, more no, no. than that. So much more. They don't let me back there, actually. It's true. It's very true. They don't so let me back there. So if you want to join a team today, just scan this QR code right up on the screen and join the party today. You got to get a part, man. You got to get a part. It's the greatest way to get a part. But speaking of serving and being faithful, man, there's a couple ways and reasons that we're able to do what we are yeah. here today, not only here on Sundays, but on Wednesday nights as well. That's true. This past Wednesday, we actually had a phenomenal youth service where three of our yeah. graduates graduating seniors got to come and speak and bring incredible. a word and let me tell you these guys are incredible it's powerhouse and they've been yeah come on give it up for our graduating seniors but they've been in our youth ministry for about six years now yeah. so from sixth graders all the way to 12th grade and man you guys may know it but youth are broke like that's true what broke is a joke man and so that's not <laughs> where the resource of the house comes from yeah. but yet because of your faithfulness and because of your giving, we're able to do incredible things like pour yeah. into the next generation and see God literally using their gifts and talents yeah. to help save their friends. Yeah, so today we just wanna take a second to be intentional to remind you to stay faithful in your tithe and offering. When you give money to this house, it's not going to waste. It's going Absolutely. to the life change and the eternity change right. of the next generation. Yeah. So we're gonna hear you. We wanna remind you today, let's be faithful in our we giving. Were, we were in high school at one point. That's true. I know we look like we're in our 40s, but. And, and if God can redeem us, he can redeem all things, praise God. <laughs> he can God. redeem 16 year old awkward Parker Brown, <laughs> he can redeem all things, I promise. It's true, and so today, let's be faithful. You can scan the QR code up on the screen. You can text any dollar amount to the number 84321, or if you're rocking that old school life, you can can give into the giving stations on your way out today. Come on. But there's so much more happening today. You already know. Already. Already. So y'all, get excited. Come on. Get pumped up. Let's do this thing. Let's get it. Traps, some lies, betrayal, some pains, some past, some hurts, some fails, some burdens I carry that are so real. But I have a God who will always pray. I got this a fiery furnace and he puts it down. The mouth of the plane was shut and pushed down. Jonah was trying to just run away, but then he was trapped by a whale in his mouth. Pits, traps, lies, betrayal. 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 Joseph was given a gift from his father, a coat that was nice and had a lot of colors. But one day, Rachel was just around the corner. His brothers were jealous, gave him to an owner. They sold him to slavery, lied to the father, took him away. Now I didn't even bother saying anything. They told him that he was dead. Like if that ain't betrayal, I don't know what is. Pits, traps, lies, betrayal. Pits, traps, lies, betrayal. Pits, traps, lies, betrayal. This is Pits, traps, lies, betrayal. Well, good morning again. Living Church, man, we're excited that you're here with us, hanging out in our series, Pits, Traps, Lies, and Betrayal. I don't know about you, if you've ever been stuck in a situation, anybody ever been stuck? Yes. Anybody ever driven their car in a ditch? Uh, this is a habit my wife has every once in a while. It's been a while, you've been doing good, baby. 
do you remember when we were dating? We were dating, well, we weren't dating yet. We were like right on the edge and we got in a fight about something. And so like we kind of weren't talking to each other. And uh, I got a call real early one morning. Rachel had driven her car in a ditch and I drove this big lifted Jeep with chains and tow straps and stuff. And I was like, I'm on my way. And so we worked that out, pulled her out of the ditch. Sometimes in life, we find ourselves in situations or circumstances that we can't get ourselves out of. There are things going on around us that we just feel like we're stuck in. And that's what we've been doing in this series. We're talking about real stories about real people in the Bible who found themselves in a pit, in a trap, someone else's lie, somebody betrayed them, and they're stuck in something they just can't get themselves out of. And so as we've been preparing for this series, I've been excited. You know, for me, I'm a creative person, and so I've got a long list of future series that I want to do. We've got stuff planned out and big ideas, and this has been one we've been wanting to do, and I've known the stories I wanted to tell. People that were in this pit or that trap, I've known the stories, and today I was super excited to tell you a great story But as I was praying and preparing that message, the Lord stopped me and he said, Trustin, I want you to put that one on the shelf because I've got a real specific story that I want you to tell the people today. I was like, God, are you sure? Because this one's done and it's really good. And he said, sit down, get to work. I want you to tell a different story to my people today. So man, I'm glad that you're here to learn about a story about a lady who got stuck in a really bad situation. The Bible tells us that she was a widow So she had no husband, her husband had passed away and she had a son that she had to take care of. And in this season of their life, there was a drought, which meant there was no rain. And in this day, in the Bible day, a drought was a big deal because droughts led to famines. You know, they didn't have irrigation systems like we have today. They didn't have pipes and plumbing and sprinkler systems and all the things. So if it didn't rain, the crops didn't grow. And if the crops didn't grow, you weren't able to eat. And they didn't have the infrastructure that we do of, you know, roads and semi-trucks and trains and stuff that could bring food from one region to another. And so if it didn't rain in your 20-mile circumference for a while, you might starve to death. And so this lady, her husband may have already died from the drought, and now she finds herself in this impossible situation. So I want to tell you her story today. But it starts with a prophet whose name is Elijah. Elijah is the voice of God. The way that it worked in this season of scripture is God would speak to a prophet and the prophet would speak to the people and that was the voice of the Lord. And so Elijah, he went to the king and it says this in 1 Kings chapter 17. Now, Elijah told King Ahab. Now, Ahab is a real jerk. This guy is a mess and his biggest problem is his wife Jezebel. So he's married to this lady named Jezebel and she is a foreigner She is from another land. She worships false gods. King Ahab is an Israelite, and he's over the Israelite people whom God loves. And he marries this lady who brings in all these false gods and idols and sets up statues and stuff. And so all of the people start following her gods instead of the God. And so the prophet Elijah goes to the king and says this. Verse 1, now Elijah told King Ahab, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. As you read in through the story, you find out that it didn't rain for three years. Well, right after Elijah gives this word, God tells him to go and hide because the king is mad, Jezebel's mad, they're gonna try to kill him. And it says in verse two, then the Lord said to Elijah, go to the east and hide by the Kerith Brook near where it enters the Jordan River. So go to this brook, you're going to have some water there. It says in verse 4, drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. Now this is kind of a crazy story, I don't have time to teach on it. But God has ravens bring meat and bread to fly to Elijah and drop it off both in the morning and at night. That's kind of crazy. That's the very first Uber delivery eat system that I think there ever was. They're bringing it by these dirty birds, bringing him some uh, $5 footlong from Subway for a year. For a whole year, he's drinking from this book, Brooke. He's eating this miraculous food that God brings. And then it says in verse seven, but after a while, the brook, it dried up. For there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Then the Lord, verse eight, said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Carephath. So I want you to go to this other village. And so I was looking it up this week. You know, in your Bible in the back, they have those maps. So I went and looked at the map and I was like, okay. So he was here and God sent him there and it was 85 miles away, 
which is a long journey for you and I, but back then they didn't have cars. They were just hoofing it. He was just busting out his Doc Martin leather sandals. Remember from back in high school? He's putting those jokers on and he's walking through the woods or walking through wherever he's trying to get to to get to this new city, 85 miles. Think about how many cities he had to pass. He probably had a buddy in this city or a friend in this city or maybe he preached at this church in this city and he's like, man, I could stop here, but God directed him to a different place. 85 miles away. And it says this, verse 10, as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow. This is our lady that we're talking about today. And she was gathering sticks. As he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? I love that it says that right as he arrives to the gate of the village, he sees this woman. He's traveled 85 miles, and he sees the woman that God sent him to. Can I just tell you something? I don't care how long you've been on a journey, God's timing is always right. God is seldom early, but he's never late. And so he shows up right in the right moment to see this lady, and he says to her, "Eh, eh, can can you get me just eh, just a little drink of water? He's like, the brook dried up. I've been walking 85 miles. Can you just get me a little drink of water? Can you just go and get me something, please? I've been on a long journey. And so this lady, I think that she recognized him. Elijah, he would have been famous at this point because the drought that they're all in is kind of his fault. He's the guy who said the word, it shall not rain. The Bible tells us that Jezebel sent out a manhunt to go and find this guy. They've probably got his picture nailed to every telephone pole within 100 miles. They're trying to find Elijah, and now here he is. And he says, would you go and get me a little drink of water? And she says, yes. Verse 11, as she was going to get it, he he called to her, "Eh, and bring me a bite of bread too. He says, I'm hungry. I'm starving to death. Those ravens haven't showed up in a while. I need something to eat. You know how if you go to Olive Garden and you run out of tea and they go to get you a tea refill, you're like, ah, can we get some more breadsticks at the table? Right? So that's what he does. He's like, can, can you just bring me a breadstick? Can you bring me a little bit of something to eat? Because I've been on this long journey. Now she knows who he is. People are trying to kill him and he steps out and he asks this lady to provide something for him. And as she's walking away, it says that she says this, but she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And all I have is only a handful of flour, just a little bit of flour, left in the jar and a little bit of cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. She says, I was just out here gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and then my son and I will die. She's stuck. This is a bad situation for this lady. Her husband is gone. She's got this young boy to feed. She doesn't have enough food. Now she's got this random dude showing up who's got a bunch of people trying to kill him, and he's asking for a piece of bread. And she says, sir, I'm sorry. The only thing that I have at home, all I have is a handful of flour. I've only got a little bit of flour, and I'm going to bake it into some bread. And the only other thing that I have is I've got a little bit of olive oil in the jar. Just in the bottom of the jar, I've got a little bit of olive oil. She says, this is all I have. And so I'm sorry that I can't give you anything because I don't even have enough for myself. But I want you to look at what the prophet says. Verse 13, but Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. I love that. You find the words don't be afraid all throughout the Bible. Anytime an angel is talking to a person or a prophet is talking to a person, don't be afraid. He's saying, I know that you're in trying times. I know that you have relational struggles. I know that you have financial need, but don't be afraid. And hey, Living Church, don't be afraid. I wanted to preach a different message today, but I think that God wants you to know that you don't need to be afraid. That he knows what's going on. He knows about the drought. He knows about the situation in your life. And he says, don't be afraid. Then the prophet goes on and he says, go ahead and do just what you have said, but make a little bread for me first. Say what, Elijah? This lady's about to die, bro. She's out there collecting sticks to make a fire, took a one more loaf of bread for her kid, then she's going to die. And now you have the audacity to say, but bring me a little bread first. 
He goes on and he says, then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. He says to her, do what you had in mind. Do what you were planning on. You see, I think that God wants us to have a plan. That we need to have a strategy in our situation. That we need to work with what we've got. Notice the lady just didn't lay down and die or didn't just say, God, you gotta do something. She was gonna cook every last bit that she had to provide for her family. She was gonna do everything that she could. And so the prophet says, go ahead and do what you have planned. And so if she was a good Texas woman, which I don't know, I think that she would have pulled out her KitchenAid mixer and she would have got her, y'all know you got one of these. I don't know why we spend $400 on them and use them every Christmas. But so we have, she gets out her kitchen egg mixer and she goes home and she gets this bit of flour and she dumps it into the, okay. into the mixer. And then she says, this is the last of the oil that I've got. This is the only thing that I have. And so she, she pours it in and she, she locks it down and she starts to mix it up and she says, okay, this is all that I've got. I've given everything that I have and I'm about to mix it up. And after some time goes by, through the magic of ministry, she's done mixing the dough and she now has the dough to make the bread. This is fun, right? You ever make dough when you're a little kid? It's like Play-Doh. And so she has this big ball of dough and she remembers what the prophet said. Her plan was is to take all of this and make it into a loaf of bread and to cook some food for her and her son, and then they're going to eat it and die. But the prophet said, but would you take just a little piece, would you take just a little piece and make some bread for me? And so she's in her kitchen in a moment of decision. Am I going to be obedient to the voice of God and give something that I need that I think that I need, give something that I want. I feel like I don't have enough already, but now am I going to choose to give in the way that God has called me to do? And so she takes a little bit, and then the Bible says that she can live off the rest. This had to be a moment that was difficult. I can imagine that she's in her kitchen with tears streaming down her face as she balls up that little tiny bit of dough. She looks at her son over in the corner, watching TV, <laughs> and she looks at him, he's hungry, and she has a choice to make. Yeah. Am I going to trust in the word of the Lord, or am I going to trust in my ability to provide for myself? She's stuck. She's in a difficult situation, and it, it says this, that the prophet said something else before she went off to cook. Verse 13, it says, but Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Oh, I already read this part. Verse 14, the prophet says, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rains and the crops go and grow again. The prophet says, hey, ma'am, if you do what I've asked you to do, I know that your bowl is empty and I know that your jar is now out of oil once you make this. But if you'll be faithful to obey the word of the Lord and give what God has asked you to give, this thing isn't going to run empty. I know that you're stressed out, I know that you're overwhelmed, and I know that it doesn't even make sense that if you give something, you're going to get something, but the prophet says that if you give, you're going to have, that you're never going to run out. Verse 15, it says, when she went away and did as Elijah told her, she obeyed the word of God, and so she puts the dough in the oven, and she starts to make her two little loaves. And after 350 degrees, for 35 minutes, she all of a sudden has for herself two loaves of bread. She has for herself a little tiny Hawaiian sweet roll. Come on, somebody. And so she's got this little Hawaiian sweet roll and she's got a big old piece of bread. She has a decision to make. Am I going to do the thing that God has directed me to do? Am I going to give to the prophet this little piece? Now remember, the prophet said that you can live off the rest. That you and your son are going to get to eat this, but if you give this, you're not going to run out anywhere else. That was the promise, that if you give this little bit, that your bowl isn't going to run empty and your jar is never going to be empty. And it says this in verse 15. So there was food every day. Somebody say every day. Every day, every day there was food for her. For listen, for Elijah and the woman and her 
family. Now, wait a minute. If I remember correctly, she said she was going to make one more loaf of bread for her and her son alone, and then they were going to die. But now, because she gave the little that she was asked, there was enough for her, her son, and this random dude named Elijah, and her whole extended family was fed off of the obedience that she stepped out in. That he was fed because she was obedient. And it goes on in verse 16. And it says, for the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry. That the, the bowl of flour, it wasn't used up. Now, I don't know how it happened. I don't know if it happened in the moment. I don't know if it happened in a big, big time and the bowl just filled up overflowing. But when she made the decision to say, I'm going to trust the word of the Lord that all of a sudden whole new levels of provision showed up and the flower never ran empty. The flower never ran out and out of nowhere it seemed like there was this flower showing up. Everybody else in the city is starving to death but then God says, hey, you don't have to starve because I'm going to provide for you in a way that you couldn't provide for yourself. God says, hey, I know that you're hungry, but in my house, when you're obedient to me, I'm going to pour out something new on you. And every day she was provided for. She never ran out of oil. It says she poured the last little bit. But you see, when we're obedient to what God would call us to do, we can tap into his resources. She was out of resource, but she had the ability to tap into God's resource because she was obedient for two more years. For two years? You can't eat off of one little amount of flour and oil for two years. So let's look at the process. She's starving to death, collecting sticks, about to make some food. The prophet shows up, says, make me a little bread. She cuts him a little piece of dough. She cooks it. She gives him a little tiny bit of bread to eat. The Bible says that her jar never ran empty, that she had flour and that she had oil. And because of that, for two years, this turned into more. This turned into something that was even greater than she could imagine. It turned into provision for her family, provision for her neighbors, provision for her son, and provision for the prophet. Why? Because she decided to obey. Because she said, you know, this little thing that I want really bad right now, I'm going to invest it in what God has called me to do, and God provided for her. So there's food every day for Elijah, the woman, and her family, for the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry. And then it says this, just as the Lord had promised, good God, just as the Lord had promised, because God promised that he was going to do it, he did something that was impossible. He provided for her above and beyond what she could have dreamt or imagined. She was ready to die, y'all. And some guy shows up and says, just give a little. And if you'll give a little, God promises that your provision won't run dry and you'll have everything that you need. Just as the Lord promised. Did you know that the Bible is full of promises? This book is full of promises from the creator of the universe that he's made to us, and God's word is true. If God says it, he meant it. But it's our obedience that activates the promise. Right. <laughs> our obedience to God's word is the thing that activates the promise. My son Titus, he wants to go to the water park this summer. And so I say, hey, buddy, you want to go to the water park? Yes, daddy. Okay. If you clean your room and keep it clean for two weeks, I'm going to take you to the water park. That's the promise that I make him. But guess what? He has to be obedient to the thing that I told him to do. And his obedience is the thing that gives him access to the thing that he wants. But if he doesn't clean his room, I'm not going to give him the thing that he asked for. God gives us promises and he says, hey, I'm going to do something great in your life. I'm going to provide for you beyond for the ability you could provide for yourself. But are we willing to obey what he said? God says all throughout the Bible, from beginning to end, that if you give a little, that God's going to be our provider, that you don't only have to be your provider anymore. You see, she obeyed and God obliged. She said, God, I'm going to follow you, and God fulfilled his word. She submitted and God sustained her because she listened to the voice of the Lord. And this is a picture that we have to get so we can live a life of more. 
We spend so much time talking about what we don't have, what we don't have. Of course, we don't have it, but our Father does. And if we would just be obedient to do the thing that our Father called us to do, He would become our provider, and we wouldn't be our only provider. So, I made a commitment to you guys a few months ago. I got up uh, while we were in the series, How to Hear from God, and uh, I talked about how the Lord had been speaking to me. We were prepped and ready to launch our building campaign. If you don't know, we don't own this building, we're renting this space. We own a building off Matlock, and we own 36 acres here in Mansfield off 287 in Heritage. And so we had done all the work, we got city approval, got all the architecture done. I showed you the video of the fly through of the new future building. But the week before we were supposed to launch the campaign, it was all done. God told me to wait. And I got mad. I'm still a little mad. (laughs) A little confused. God, I don't understand why you've told me to wait. And God, he said, son, if you'll build the people, I'll build the building. He said, I want you to spend your time building the people, speaking truth to the people, and I'm going to worry about the thing that's bigger than you can figure out on your own anyways. And so I said, God, okay, I'm going to do it. But I realized I've missed something. And so I have to apologize to you. I thought that because I wasn't raising funds to build a building, that I didn't need to talk about generosity. And this week as I was praying, had another message prepared, God said something to me. He said, son, don't steal the blessings I have promised them by not teaching about financial obedience. It would be unfair of me as a pastor who loves you to not talk to you about the blessings that God has for you that are connected to your financial obedience. I cannot only view talking about finances in association with building a building that the truths I'm about to share with you are truths no matter what's happening in the church or not. And so I want us to understand the promises that God has for us. This lady in the Bible was about to die, but God made her a promise. And because she obeyed that promise, he provided. So the scripture is full of hundreds of promises. I've picked out four. I've only got time to talk about four promises. Here's the four promises that I want to talk about today. These are true for me and for you. In my life, in my finances, in your life, in your finances. If God said it, he meant it. Promise number one, Proverbs 3.10. Your barns, your storage places will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. That sounds like good news to me. I want to have a life that's blessed. Promise number two. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. I want a good measure poured onto me. That sounds like a blessing. Third one, God will generously provide all you need. That's another promise. That God will provide what you need. It's a promise that God made us. Fourth one, God says, I will pour out a blessing so great, you won't have enough room to take it in. How about that? He wants to give you so much blessing that you can't even contain the things that he has for you. So those are the promises But the promises have a prerequisite. You know what a prerequisite is? A prerequisite is something that has to happen first. Before you can go to fourth grade, you have to pass third grade. Before you get your driver's license, you have to pass the driver's test. It's a prerequisite. And so God gives us some prerequisites to the promise. And what I've learned is they're always in proximity. The prerequisite is always in proximity to the promise. Come on, somebody. I worked on that for y'all this week. The promise is in proximity to the promise. It's always close. It's always just right there. So let's look at the very first one, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 10. I just read it. It says, your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. That's the promise. But look at what's in proximity right before it. It says this, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth. You want the promise. Here's the prerequisite. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all of your crops. That's the prerequisite. I love that it says honor with your wealth. It doesn't say honor if you're wealthy. But what a lot of times we do 
is we look at somebody else who has a bigger house and a newer car, and we think that the Bible's for them. No, 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 no. It doesn't say if you're wealthy, it says in your wealth. If you have one penny in your pocket today, God's talking to you. If you make 15000 or $150,000 a year, you have some wealth. If you ate dinner last night and drove a car here to get to church today, there's some wealth that God has blessed you with. And God says to honor the Lord with our wealth and to give him our first fruit. Remember what Elijah said? He said, make me a little bread first. This makes complete sense to me that we should give to God first because we don't give leftovers to those we love. We don't give leftovers to those we love. If you uh, like to cook, if you like to cook and you're making a meal and you invite some of your favorite people over, friends or family, and they come to your house and you got brisket and you got some cornbread and you got some uh, mashed potatoes, come on somebody, and you got all this stuff, you got some pie in the fridge, you made all this stuff and they all get there to eat, do you know what you don't do? You don't go to that fridge and you pull into the back and find a five day old piece of pizza with a bite taken out of it and give it to them. You don't do that. You know why? Because you love them. But many times people who say they love God only give God sloppy seconds. We spend and spend and spend and spend and spend and spend and then we go to God and we go, I'm broke God. And we wonder why our jar is empty. We wonder why our bowl has nothing in it. It's because God says that we need to honor him with our wealth. We pay our mortgage or our rent and our insurances and our utilities and our cell phone bill and we have like 19 different streaming platforms. We're playing Hulu and Netflix and Disney Plus and Apple TV and all the others. I don't even know what they all are. We're paying all of them on time. Then we're paying, uh, you know, we got to go to Starbucks at least five times a week and give them $9 for a bunch of sugar that's giving us sickness, right? And then, then it, you know, it's just Thursday night and like I know we just renovated our kitchen two years ago, but I don't feel like cooking. So we're going to go to Chipotle and spend $45 on a a couple burritos. Can, can I just be real? We got more shoes than our closet can even hold, but I need to run up to the mall to get some new kicks, you know what I'm saying? And so this is what we do in our life. And then at the end of the month, we go to God and say, hey, God, hey, hey, God, thanks for saving me from hell. Thanks for forgiving me of my sins. But God says that we need to give him our first fruits. That at the top of the month, we would say, hey God, I'm gonna trust you. That we wouldn't give him what's left over. Because after obedience is the promise. Next promise that God has, I already read it for you. Luke chapter six, verse 38, it says this. A good measure, that means a lot, that's pressed down and shaken together and is running over will be poured into your lap. Now, I love Chick-fil-A, and so I take my kids to the drive through at Chick-fil-A because they need some nuggets, and you know I need that spicy sandwich. Come on. And so I go to Chick-fil-A, and I order my spicy sandwich, and I reach my big old hand into the bag because I want to pull out some of these waffle fries because they're magically delicious. And so I reach my hand in, and I pull out. This just happened this week, and this is the large fry. And I'm like, what did you do, Chick-fil-A? I'm a man of God. Like, what did you do to me? And I'm sad and I'm disappointed. I'm upset because this is not a good measure. This is not overflowing. No one shook this up and put some more fries in it. But every once in a while, you go to Chick-fil-A and they have an anointed individual who really wants to make it your pleasure, who gives you some French fries. And when they fill it up, man, they fill that puppy up. Like the French fries are overflowing and you're eating those French fries and then You know, you eat all the fries in the container and you still got like one bite left. You still got one bite left in that spicy sandwich and you look in the bag and in the bag is that bonus fry. And you dig down in there and you like, I got the bonus fry because somebody just went a little over and above poured out blessing. This is what the Bible says. This is what God wants to do. He wants to do in our lives. It says a good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. That's the promise. But here's the prerequisite. Verse 38. Give. We want this. But the prerequisite to this. Give. And it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. Say what? 
with the measure you use to give unto the Lord is the same that he will use to give unto you. There's a correlation between our generosity and our provision from heaven. There's a correlation. They're connected. This is a concept weaved all throughout Scripture. But that we have to give to him first. Give unto the Lord. Do you know what God's heart is? Is that people would get saved? God's heart is that people would come into a real relationship with Jesus. And the predominant way that he does that in our culture is through the local church. People invite a friend to come to church with them while they're at church. A pastor teaches what the Bible says. They learn his mercies are new every morning. They get saved. This is what God does. And so it's the reason that we do what we do. You know, I get up here and speak every week. And right now I'm teaching. And I have this microphone on my head. And I have this little battery pack in my pocket. And in this little battery, in this little thing, are these two batteries. They're two double A's. Y'all bought these. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Because you gave, I have the power to talk about the goodness of God. Exactly right. So you gave these batteries, but you also gave this, ba- this uh, little battery pack and this little fancy headset thing. Yeah. Bailey, this is what, like 800? Yeah. yeah, yeah, $800 for this. And so I talk, and this thing like sends some kind of internet signal back to the sound booth. In the sound booth, A-Rod's back there, and it has this little box that's got antennas on it, and it like takes my voice out of the air like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory somehow, and it like puts it in there, and it, and it does something with it, and it goes through some computers and stuff, and y'all bought that too. Those of you who gave bought that. You gave and you bought that, and then the, the, my words, they come through a wire, and the wire comes over here, and it goes into this speaker, it's bolted on this thing, I, sh- I probably should not turn this handle. Is that correct? Okay, I should not turn this handle. And so the, the wires, look, here's a wire. Oh God, there's a wire right here. And so my voice is going up this wire into that speaker and y'all bought those speakers. So you can hear me. And if I talk real low, like this, you hear me out of this subwoofer and y'all paid for that too. And so the way that the word of the Lord is proclaimed is through your generosity. We pay $10,000 a month to rent Willie Pig. T- 10000 What's your rent? $10,000 a month to rent this place? And we have our mortgage at the Matlock location. And we're paying for our 36 acres, acres, which was the greatest deal in all of Mansfield history. That was a steal, y'all. God's going to bless us in that. Why? Why do we do all of these things? So more people can get to know about Jesus. Did you know that we could not fit in our Matlock building? We were doing four services there. Four services, and we felt like the Lord led us here so we could have more room to teach more people about the love of Jesus. But the only way that that can happen is if people will facilitate the ministry happening. And God's heart is for people to know his love. But we have to give. Is your money helping people know Jesus? Thank you. Is, your, is, your, is the way that you're spending only putting shoes in your closet and a car in your garage and a vacation on your Instagram so you can be in competition with the people you went to high school with you don't even talk with anymore? Is the money that you're spending sending people to heaven or is it only feeding you? Because God says that if we would give to him a little first, that we are not our provider, but that he makes the decision to step in and be our provider. It's a promise from the Lord. And while I'm on it, and since this is the second service so I can preach a little bit longer because I don't have another service knocking on my back door, the money that you invest in the kingdom is the only money you'll ever see again. Someday in heaven, everybody who asks Jesus in their heart is going to get into heaven, but there are different levels in heaven and different giftings in heaven where we spend eternity We might live 80 or 100 years here, but the only thing we see in heaven is what we invest in the kingdom today. And so the poorest among us will be the richest among us up there if they have a generous heart. I don't have time. Here's here's the next promise. Here's the next promise. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. God will generously provide all you need. That's good. All all you need? God wants to generate. You know we serve a generous God? We don't serve it by the skin of your teeth, God. Right. No. He's an above and beyond God. He's El Shaddai. He is more than enough. In, uh, in the garden, when he made Adam and Eve, 
He could have just given like three trees to eat from. But he gave them a giant garden with hundreds of acres full of trees because he's a God of more than enough. When the Israelites left Egypt, the Bible says the Egyptians heaped gold on them. That's why God sent all the plagues instead of just like miraculously making them leave because he wanted to bless them. Someday we're going to go to heaven and walk on streets of gold, not cement. Why? Because we serve a generous God. So God will generously provide all you need. That's the promise. Now here's the prerequisite in proximity. Put it up, verse 6. It says, remember this. It gives us an illustration. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. This message is not pressure. This message is teaching. Living in church is doing great. This is not me up here begging you because we got bills to pay. This is me up here loving you enough to talk about the promises that God has for us. You must decide in your heart how much to give, not reluctantly or response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Here's the promise, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. It starts with remember the farmer. Remember the farmer. That if you only take five seeds and you plant those five seeds in your field, you're only going to grow five plants. But if instead of eating all your seed and you plant a lot of the seed, you're going to have a much bigger harvest. Farmers have semi-trucks full of seed so they can have an even greater harvest. It's an idea that makes total sense. And God gives to us in the proportion of what we give to him. This is good news because the Bible teaches percentage over amount. It's not about amounts. It's about the condition of the heart and the percentages that we would give. This is why God, all throughout Scripture, from the beginning of the Bible, from pre-Moses, in the law of Moses, and after the ascension of Jesus, the scripture talks about the tithe, the 10%, tenth tithe. Because God doesn't need an amount from us, he wants our heart, and our heart follows a percentage. 10% is just representative of the whole. If you can count to 10, you can count to a million. It's just 10 over and over and over and over and over again. So the 10 is representative of everything else that we have. And God says, just give me the 10th. You know, this week, right now, Pastor Whitney isn't here because Pastor Whitney is preaching for a church plan that we support. Because I believe that in the same way that Rachel and I should give 10%, that as an organization of the church, that we should give 10%. And so me as the leader... I'm, not, I'm going to make sure that we don't eat everything that we bake, but that we're going to say, hey, God, we're going to give away to help spread the news of your love. And so Pastor Whitney's preaching for a church right now. We give them $1,000 a month because I remember what it was like to start the church without anybody's support. And so I don't want them to grind like we had to in the early years. I want them to have some support. We had our friend the other day from Japan. He was here, and he talked about how he's a missionary and how we bought him a bunch of bounce houses and a bunch of lights for his building, and he's reaching people in a place that do not even know the name of Jesus, and we celebrate when we gave to him. We talked about Pastor John Bohr. He's from Vegas. He's been here a couple times. We bought them all the chairs in their auditorium, and we celebrate the generosity. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. I just posted something on my personal social media that I wasn't even going to let out, but somebody heard about it and wrote a news story about it. And once it's out, I might as well make a statement about it. But that we blessed another church plant who needed a roof. And I remember in our Matlock building when we needed a roof and God provided in a crazy way. God, so many stories, man. Back then when we needed a roof at our Matlock building, God told me to buy a single parent a car. So we bought a single parent. We didn't even tell nobody. We bought a single parent a car for three grand. And within two months, all of the money came in for new roof, new air conditioners in the Matlock building. Why? Because I, God said, hey, just, just give a little. And now we have the ability to put a whole new roof on a whole other church because it's about the gospel of Jesus being preached all around the world, not just here in our place. And so God, the Bible says that he loves a cheerful giver. Which should bring some self-inspection. Because how do you feel right now? How do you feel when one of our pastors gets up and takes up the offering? 
How do you feel when that bucket passes by? How do you feel when they say, take out your phone and scan the QR code all the way from the back of the room? How do you feel in your heart when we're taking up the offering? Are you generous or are you thinking, man, all the church wants is my money? I hear people say that a lot. All the church wants is money. Not about living church, but about church in an entirety. All the church, they're just a bunch of money grubby preachers. I've driven the same truck for 10 years, has 200,000 miles on it. And I came to plant this church and didn't get paid for a year and didn't make over $20,000 for the first six years. Because y'all aren't my provider, God is. God's my provider, not y'all. So I don't got to beat the sheep to try to get paid. God's my provider. In case you didn't know. And so what happens is people say, all the church wants is my money. Well, I would really contradict that because I don't think, Aaron, we didn't have ushers out there with bags that they had to buy a ticket to get in today, right? Yes, Guys, did, anybody, did any ushers charge you to get in? If they did, I wanna have a conversation with them being punched, right? <laughs> no, but if you go to the movies, you gotta buy a ticket before you go see the movie. Right. If you go to the Cowboys game, you gotta buy a ticket before you get in the Cowboys game. Yep. If you go to Chick-fil-A, you gotta give them money before they give you some chicken. Yep. All they want is your money. But here you can come in and get fed. You can get a free Bible every week. You can learn about God's word. You can build community, go to life groups. There's a lot of free things in the church. So this idea that all the church wants is money is the devil manipulating a couple bad preachers who mismanaged some finances. So don't let the devil trick you to not think that God has something he wants to do in your life. That's good. You know, you couldn't stop me and Rachel from giving. You couldn't stop us from giving. Because we've seen God so many times do things that don't make any sense because we said, okay, God, it's not a lot. It's not a lot. I was making $20,000 a year and we still gave over and above our tithe because we knew that the principles of God were true. But our obedience is the thing that activates the promise. Last one, Malachi 3.10. Did I read all the first one? Yep, Malachi 3.10. The promise is this, I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. God wants to pour a blessing that we can't even contain. And just for clarity, the way that God blesses is not only financially. So it's not that if you just give $10 in the plate, God's gonna hook you up tomorrow in your wallet. But God blesses us with peace. He blesses us with joy. He blesses us with health. He blesses us with open doors of opportunity, with favor, that God blesses us in ways that we can't even calculate. And I don't know about you, but I know a whole lot of rich people that aren't happy. I know a whole lot of rich people that their marriage is falling apart. I know a whole lot of people with a lot more money than me that don't have any health. You see, God blesses more than just financially. And so God says, I will pour a blessing so great you can't even contain it. How are some of these people in this church so happy? Because God has blessed prosperity on their life. So let's look at the prerequisite to the promise that's in proximity. Malachi 3, 8 through 12, it says this. Should people cheat God? This is God talking. Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean, God? When did we ever cheat you? It's not like you were playing uh, you know, blackjack with God and you had an ace up your sleeve and he didn't know about it, right? He's not talking about that. He gives the response. You have cheated me of the tithes and the offering due to me. The Bible says all over the place that the first 10% goes to God. And when we give the first 10%, then the rest of the 90% is blessed. That when we say, hey God, I'm going to trust you with this, he says, I'm going to bless the rest of everything that you have. Verse nine, listen. You, if you don't give, are under a curse. Your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there'll be enough food in my temple. Let's talk about that curse. It's not like God's up in heaven like a witch doctor. (laughs) He's not like voodoo and, you know, curses. We're already living in a fallen world. We already live in a world full of sin. Things already go wrong all the time. There already is a very real devil who wants to steal, to kill and destroy everything in your life. Our money is already cursed. And God says that when you take that 10% and give it to him, that the 90% is blessed. That the 90% is under a protection, is under a covering. And he gives some detail there, and it says to bring it into the storehouse. 
The storehouse is the place that you're fed from. My hope as your pastor every single week that when you come is that I've prepared a meal that would be spiritually nutritious and feed you. I work really hard at cooking this up for you. That you would have something that would be beneficial for your spiritual life. If you have kids right now over in Living Kids, they're being fed a spiritual meal. If you have teenagers that show up on Wednesday, we had over 100 teenagers show up on this Wednesday at Living Youth. God's doing something great in our teenagers. If your kid goes to Living Youth, they're being fed there. That's the storehouse. I don't go to Chick-fil-A and get food and then go to Wendy's and give them my money. I put my finances in where the place that's blessing me is. And God says that your tithes should go to the storehouse. But what a lot of people want to do is they want to lord over the tithe. And they'll say, uh, you know, I don't really believe that. <laughs> I, what I feel like doing is, you know, I want to just give some to this person. And, and I want to give some of this, you know, over here. I got a person at work that needs something. And, and I, you, know, uh, my, uh, you know, my cousin, you know, they need new tires in their car. And so I want to do this. No, no, no. That's called generosity. We should be generous. We should give to other people. Rachel and I give way above our 10% when we start looking at how generous we are towards other people. But the scripture says that we should bring the 10th, the tithe, into the storehouse so that there'll be room, so there'll be food for people to eat. Then God says something crazy. He says, try it. Try it. Put me to the test. Try it. Try it. Put me to the test. God says, see if I won't. See if I won't. God says, give me a little and watch what happens. Now that doesn't mean you give a little today and like tomorrow you're about to hit the lottery. That's not what I'm talking about. But what if for the next quarter, what if for the next four months, you said, hey God, I don't know how this whole thing works, but I'm going to test you. I'm going to step out in faith and believe that you're going to do something and I'm going to test you. God says, test me in this. And God promises your crops will be abundant. Your investments, your hours at work, your promotions, your employment, your open doors will be abundant. God says, for I will guard them from insects and disease. I will guard them from attack. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they ripen. I'm going to teach you financial timing, God says. Says the Lord of heaven's armies, the nations will be called blessed, for your land will be such a delight. These are promises that God has for us. It's just, are we going to be obedient to the prerequisites? I understand that tithing is hard, and it doesn't make any sense. I'm good at math. It doesn't make sense that 90% can go farther than 100%. It doesn't make any sense. But test him. What I've learned in my life is that the tithe is a test of trust. Everyone say trust. It's a test of trust. So Aaron and Zach are going to come help me and Maddie. So uh, listen to this. Zach, you're going to be the people. And so Zach might find himself in a financial situation or he's sitting here trying to figure out, you know, should I, should I trust God? And so here, I want you to stand here. And Aaron, I want you to stand here. Uh, back up just a little bit. Okay, now put your arms out. Okay, now Zach, you know Aaron. You, 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 you've, you've worked out, you've moved things with Aaron. You know he's a strong guy. And so I'm gonna count to three and I want you to fall backwards and I want you to let him catch you. All right. Ready? One, two, three. Got him. Come on. Give it up, Aaron. Good job. Okay. Now, he got him. Now, now, come stand right here. Now, Maddie, come here. Zach, you know Maddie? She works in, she, you know her from Living Kids? She's the best. Okay, turn around. Okay, Maddie, stick your arms out. Okay. Are you ready? Sure. Okay, he said sure. Here we go. We're going to fall back. One, two, three. What? What? What, what happened? You, you can't, you can't do it? I, I got scared. He got scared. Okay. Now, the reason, so come stand right here. Aaron, come over here. The reason that Zach got scared is because he understood that maybe Maddie doesn't have the equipment needed to catch him. But he knows Aaron and he trusts that Aaron would be able to catch him. Let me ask you a question. How big is your God? How, ser seriously, how big is your God? 
Because if our view is that God is so small that he can't provide for us, then what are we following him for anyways? What are we worshiping? I'm trusting my eternal security and salvation from hell in a God who is big and strong and mighty and powerful. But for me and my friends that are clapping and tears streaming down their face and rejoicing this morning, what they're doing is they're celebrating because God's caught them before. Thanks guys. We have to understand that our God is bigger than we would believe. And so maybe you feel stuck. Maybe you feel scared. I'm gonna give you some homework. I'm not going to pass the buckets again. It'd be a really good time to, but I'm not going to do it because this is not about this is not about a momentary financial need. We're doing fine. This is about someone who loves you trying to teach you the promises of God. That God wants to take the little that you give and turn it into something greater. So here's the homework. Go home, put pencil to paper, Open up your checking account, review your credit card statements, look over your bills, and see how much you're giving to the Lord. And then, ask yourself a question. How much do I trust Him? That's all I want you to do. I don't want to, it's not under compulsion. I want you to take some time. If you're not managing your finances, that's not good either. God just doesn't bless you to live stupidly. God might already be blessing you, just got bad spending habits. Oh, I'm gonna make somebody mad, so I'm not even gonna go there. <laughs> that you would review your finances and say, what out of my money are helping people know Jesus? What out of my money am I investing in heaven? And then make the change that God speaks to you. For some of you, I think that you could step into tithing immediately. There's a few adjustments, a few changes that you could make in your budget, and you could step into full obedience like hundreds of families at Living Church already have. That you could step into tithing. For some of you, that stresses you out. Well, how much could you commit to give unto the Lord? 3%? Give 3% or 5%? So what I'd ask, is for you to do some homework and to actually put pen to paper so that next week when the offering's passed, you know in your heart how much you're investing into the kingdom. And if it's 3%, I want you to do that for four months. And at the end of the four months, God promises that he will bring increase. That you're gonna look back at the end of the month and say, oh, we got some money left over. If you manage your finances well, God's gonna bless it. And then you go from 3% to 5%, then from 5% to 7%, then from 7% to 10%. And then before you know it, God's opening the floodgates of heaven and now you're living this kind of life. An overflow, an abundant life, so that when you see a need, you can meet it. You know how fun it is to meet needs of people? Rachel makes me mad sometimes because we go to the grocery store and it feels like every time we're at the grocery store, we get behind somebody with not enough money. And here goes my wife. She pulls out her credit card and we buy their groceries. And I used to get mad at her for it until I understood that God loves a cheerful giver. Until I understood that when I would invest in somebody I don't even know and say, hey, Jesus loves you, you should come visit on a Sunday, that God would bring some prosperity into our life because we're not trusting us, we're trusting him. Good God, there's some homework. And start to give to the storehouse and watch what God does. Let me pray for you. God. Thank you for your people. Lord, I thank you for convicting me to speak this word. Because I want us to live under your provision, not mine. I am not a fundraiser. That is not what you've called me to do. You've called me to teach your truth. And so Lord, as we speak truth, I ask that as people obey, that you would provide. Speak to them this week, Lord. If there's anyone here who's been done dirty by a church before, or they invested in something sketchy happen, Lord, let them know that that story is not this story and that we can't let yesterday's offenses determine tomorrow's decisions, but that you have new things for them. I thank you for your goodness and for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand. I got one more thing. Maybe you're here today and you're far from God. You don't even know God. 
You know the Bible says one of the most famous verses in all of Scripture? It says, for God so loved the world that he gave. God already gave the most valuable thing that he had, his one and only son, and that whoever would believe in him would become saved and live with God for eternity in heaven. That all you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you'll be made new. So today with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're not in a right relationship with Jesus today, you can be, super easy. You just have to ask him to forgive you of your sin and to come into your heart. And that's the beginning of your journey with Jesus. So on the count of three, I'm just gonna ask that you raise your hand and look up at me. I'm not gonna make you get out of your seat or embarrass you, I promise. The Bible says that God is faithful and just to forgive you. If that's you on the count of three, raise your hand up. One, two, three. If that's you this morning. Say, I wanna ask Jesus, yep, I see you. I'll see you right over here. Anybody else say, yep, I see you. Say, today is my day. Living Church, would you pray with me and those that have their hands up, everyone in the whole room, pray this out loud. Say this, dear God, forgive me my sin and come into my heart. From this day forward, I'm gonna live for you. Because of your love, I believe my best days are ahead of me. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, put your hands together. Amen. Come on. Church, good day. Can we give it up for our pastor and that great message? I wanted to take just a moment to share my heart and my experience with your pastor's generosity because it can be real easy to see him up here in a room for that we pay ten thousand dollars a month and not know the backstory of his heart for generosity you see when living church 10 years ago wasn't making a dime when we were all in the red as pastors because we were paying to fund what we believed god would do not receiving big fat pastor checks for what we believed god would do I showed up to my very first staff meeting wearing a pair of shoes I jacked from my dad's closet that were so pitiful that the front end of the toe was like flapping and talking as I walked around all day. You know what? A lot of people saw me walking in that shoe all day, but it was Pastor Trust and Rachel that actually did something about it. And they greeted me the very next Sunday with a bag with two pairs of dress shoes. Now, Living Church didn't pay for these dress shoes because we weren't making anything him spending his afternoons flipping cars, him spending his weekdays laying turf, that's what paid for those shoes. And so it can seem really cute and flippant, but I know the heart behind that man that gave when he didn't know how he was gonna pay his own rent sometimes. And I'll be wearing out shoes for the rest of my life because of his generosity. And so Living Church, you can take what he says about generosity to the bank. Today, if you're here and you accepted Jesus, you started your journey with him for the very first time ever, can I tell you that the batteries in the pack, all of this, all of this was for you. We call it the main event back there. It's some tables where we wanna just meet you, celebrate with you, give you a Bible, and just congratulate you on the journey that Jesus has started, because this is what it's all for, is for the main event. And so Living Church, can we pray as we go about our week? God, thank you for all that you've done. Challenge us with generosity. Bless those who give. Bring us back here safely next week because we know that there's more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We love you guys. We'll see you next week.